Hello everyone. This week we're going to take a bit of a jump forward in time and start looking at some Waka and Waka events which date from the mid to late Heian period. By this time, composing Waka while still retaining social aspects was also becoming significantly more important as a literary art and critical judgments about what made a good or bad poem were becoming clearer. The easiest way to show this and to demonstrate the types of ideas about which poet critics debated is through a discussion of poetry competitions, as these were significant venues for the formation and production of these types of criticism and ideas. I already presented a brief introduction to Utawase a few weeks ago when I talked about the social use of waka, but today I'm going to go into the topic in somewhat more depth to give you a better idea of the process by which poetry contests developed as waka developed as a genre and, dare I say it, a way of life. So let's get started. If you remember, the very first complete recorded Utawase poetry competition is variously known as the poetry competition held by Minister of Popular Affairs Yukihira, Mimbukyo Yukihira no Utawase, or the poetry competition held at the residence of the Minister for Popular Affairs, Mimbukyo no Ie no Utawase, and was held at some point in the summer 885 or 887. Even here, in the first recorded competition, elements which were to become standard in later Utawase are present. Topics are set on which poems are composed, seasonal poems precede love poems, the poems are delivered in rounds of two, presented by a poet of the left and one of the right, and rounds are either one by one side or tied. Other features, however, are absent. There are no comments by the poets on their opponents' poems, nor is there a written explanation from the judge about the basis for his judgments. Indeed, even the identities of the poets and judge remain obscure, but the former would seem to have been satisfied with the judge's assessments, for no one has written an appeal, chinjo, against them a feature that became much more common later. What I hope this brief mention of Yukihira's contest shows is an important starting point for any discussion of Utawase, the definition of what an Utawase is. The initial part of the expression Uta is relatively unproblematic as it's the standard word for poem in pre-modern Japanese. The second, Awase, though, is more difficult as the literal translation is putting together. Exactly how poems were put together at these events varied widely, with the result that the term can be translated as poetry competition, poetry contest, poetry match, and any number of similar expressions. But some utawase involved very little or no competition, poems were not judged or criticised, and in others the focus of the event was on other objects, with the poems present to provide an additional aesthetic counterpoint rather than being the main focus. Similarly, while the term poetry competition may conjure up the image of a literary critical event, in many early cases utawase were held with social or political purposes in mind, and while poetry may have been produced and discussed there, this was incidental to the main reason for holding the competition. Any discussion of utawase, therefore, must start with the large caveat that any individual feature of poetry competitions mentioned will not be present in all of them. Hagitani Boku, in his Heianjo Utawase Gaisetsu, suggests that the Utawase emerged from the common pastimes of the court nobility. They were used to competitive events, such as sumo matches, and so it felt natural to them to indicate winners and losers when two poets recited poems on the same topic at social gatherings. Given the centrality of waka to their lives, it was also natural to include poetry in other types of matches. The Edo period scholar Kurokawa Haramura lists 69 different types of such events, and so it is often difficult to state with certainty that an individual occasion is purely an utawase, because frequently a contest is not wholly a poetry competition with only poems being compared. An example of this would be the Palace Chrysanthemum Contest, Daeri Kiku Awase, which I discussed a few weeks ago too, when talking about social waka usage. Both the flowers and the poetry were integral to the event, which was an opportunity for a display of aesthetic sensibility and talent in literary, artistic and horticultural form. There are many similar utawase where it is difficult to determine whether they are wholly poetry competitions or other types of awase. Scholars have, therefore, proposed a wide variety of criteria for classifying these events, highlighting different aspects of utawase and serving to demonstrate their multifaceted nature. 
Hagitani alone, for example, provides 10 different classification systems for Utawase in the Heian period, according to 1. the social status of the competition's sponsor or location, 2. the level of formality of the competition's organisation, 3. the extent to which an Utawase was linked with an event where other objects were matched, 4. the degree to which a competition was an entertainment or a cultural event, 5. the degree to which poets were formally involved, 6. the conditions under which poems were selected, 7. the form in which judgments were delivered, 8. the standpoints of the judges, 9. the topics which were covered, and 10. the order in which rounds took place. To these could be added systems based simply on when a competition took place, the number of rounds, the identity of the judges, the identities of the poets, the quantity of the poets involved, the type of poetry, kanshi or waka, and so forth, to say nothing of the degree of a competition's literary significance. Thus, it is important to realise that poetry-focused utawase, where poems were the main focus of the event and critical assessments were made, were merely one type of utawase and occupy one end of a continuum of social and literary custom and practice. Broadly speaking, utawase, which took place earlier in the Heian period, had a more strongly social than literary critical character, while those at the end were more purely literary events. However, given the close personal ties between members of the nobility, even literary utawase were also social occasions, and given the intricate intertwining of poetry and politics in court life, they could also function as political statements and arenas where careers were made or broken. They could even be, literally, matters of life and death. Tradition has it that one poet starved himself to death after losing in the final round of a competition judged by Emperor Murakami. Less seriously, but nevertheless indicative of the importance placed on success in Utawase, Kamo no Chomei recounts that the monk Doin went weeping to visit Fujiwara no Kiyosuke after the latter assigned a loss to one of his poems in another competition. Competitions were socially complex events, reflecting the nature of court society. They could be sponsored by a wide range of individuals, including the emperor, crown prince, empress, imperial consorts, and members of the nobility. Participants could be members of the imperial family, senior nobility, both male and female, junior nobility, both male and female, or members of the clergy. Sometimes, the participants were just that, men and women who had commissioned poems from lower-ranking poets and presented them for consideration at the competition. Sometimes the poets themselves took part. Teams for poetry competitions could be all-male, all-female, or a mixture of both. Thus, not only do Utawase demonstrate the interweaving of social, political and literary factors in court events, they also highlight the different ways in which men and women participated in these events. As is well known, court ladies were frequently accomplished poets and were often credited with the skill to silence male interlocutors with their ability to provide a witty impromptu poem to suit any occasion. So much so that Fujiwara no Kiyosuke devotes part of his treatise, Fukuro Zoshi, Bag of Miscellany, to revealing the secret teachings of how a man can escape from this embarrassing situation. For example, he says, when a woman at court recites a poem, one should pretend once or twice not to have heard. The woman will then repeat the verse. During this time, one should attempt to come up with an idea for a response. If nothing comes to mind, one should ask again to have the poem recited. The woman will become annoyed and will not speak. If, if even after that interval nothing comes to mind, one should say, oh, I have business elsewhere and flee. This is indeed an important secret teaching. Or as an alternative strategy, one should recite one's response poem faintly, and when the woman asks to have it repeated, recite it again in an indistinct manner. When the woman asks again, respond that you have business elsewhere and flee. Again, if a woman suddenly makes a roundabout allusion to a poem and one does not know what she is referring to, one should respond, I wonder if that may not be so. Whatever the case, this will be an appropriate response. Nevertheless, women also frequently participated in utawase as either sponsors, participants or poets, particularly between the 9th to mid-11th centuries, during which time nearly 70 contests had female sponsors. 
In this period, court women's participation in Udawase often provided a form of scripted erotic play to create a celebratory sense of wholeness, as Rosalie Bundy puts it, with their poetry serving to provide a voice to a higher-ranking woman who was marrying a higher-ranking man, while the male poet's works provided the man's part of the conversation. Alternatively, male poets' complaints, when losing to female teams, that the judge have been swayed by their erotic allure rather than their poetry, serves to highlight the role women played in political relations at court and the balance between competing actors such as the imperial house and the nobility. We saw an example of just such a complaint by one of the princes taking part in a contest judged by Emperor Uda a few weeks ago. Thus, the poetry contest, while ostensibly a literary and aesthetic event, also served to reaffirm and celebrate the political and social orders and the accepted roles for men and women within these. Competitions also tended to reflect wider developments in the role of waka in the lives of the nobility and others, resulting in their having different characters in different historical periods. Setsuko Ito characterises Utawase into three broad periods, a golden age in the Heian period, a Silver Age in Kamakura, and an Iron Age subsequently. Thus, competitions in the late 9th and 10th centuries functioned as entertainments and social occasions, and other elements such as music and material objects were a frequent feature of contests. By the 11th century, when there was increased recognition of waka as a literary genre and thus the need to assess individual poems critically, competitions became venues for discussion. This trend continued in the 12th and early 13th centuries as poetic schools began to develop, meaning that poetry took centre stage in competitions and they occurred between representatives of different poetic lineages and viewpoints as means for them to make a public case about the validity of their views on waka. It was in this period that major contests such as Rob Pyakuban Utawase, the poetry contest in 600 rounds, and Sengo Pyakuban Utawase, the poetry contest in 1500 rounds, took place. Following this period of intense critical activity, however, factionalism and disagreements between poetic schools developed to such an extent that competitions between them became impossible. This resulted in a decrease in both the size of Utawase and in the range of participants, and by the early 14th century they became small and intimate, more like seminars, as Robert Huey puts it, where poets could test out their newest compositions before an audience of like-minded individuals. There was a further reason for the decrease in competition size, the decline in the economic resources available to members of the nobility. Bluntly, they could no longer afford to conduct competitions of great size and formality. As a result of this, poets had to seek novel ways of maintaining the utawase form. This resulted in the late 14th and early 15th centuries in the development of fictional competitions where all the poems were written by a single poet. These were often satirical in nature, with the participants being represented as commoners, animals, or even utensils, such as in the Chodo Utawase, the poetry contest held by personal effects, attributed to Sanjo Nishi Sanekata, Sanetaka. If fictional co commoners could conduct poetry competitions, then there was no reason why real ones could not. And so once Japan was unified under Tokugawa rule at the beginning of the 17th century, and there was time for peaceful pursuits, a new group of literati developed in major metropoli such as Edo and Osaka, originating from the samurai and merchant classes. These men and women pursued many types of literary study and production, which had once been the exclusive preserve of the court nobility, one of which was the composition of criticism of waka, which led naturally to the conducting of poetry competitions. The factionalism which had riven the poetic circles of the court, however, was reflected among these poets too meaning that criticism and judgment in the competitions of this period devolved into little more than bickering over minor faults, which could nevertheless become sufficiently rowdy to cause complaints from those hearing them. Minegishi Yoshiaki relates an anecdote about a contest which took place in the 1830s, where the poets, so that they could argue without disturbing anyone else, hired a boat to hold their utawase. They set off and were still arguing about the poems in the first round when it was somewhere around two in the morning. Not expecting things to have been going on for so long, the boat oarsman fell asleep and it drifted down the river until it reached the embankment below the mansion of an important dignitary. 
The poets were arguing so loudly that they attracted the attention of the dignitary's guards, who came running with lit torches to see what was going on. Worried that they would get into trouble, the poets hurriedly pushed off the boat and fled, resolving to never have another competition on the river. Utawase continued to be held even after the advent of Japan's modern age in the Meiji period and beyond. A fictional contest with illustrations, Toyo Fuzoku Utawase, was published in 1907, and as late as the 25th of November 1950, a contest in three rounds was broadcast on NHK during its women's hour, Fuji no Jikan. Nowadays, however, with the exception of recreations by waka enthusiasts, it's fair to say that the poetry competition as a venue for criticism and development is more or less dead. Even pure poetry competitions, however, varied in their degree of formality and the level of involvement of people other than poets and judge. Some were relatively intimate occasions, where like-minded poets could gather to hear each other's latest work and receive advice on improvement from someone with more experience. Others were arenas of conflict between opposing poetic ideals, which served to throw disagreements into relief. Still others were opportunities for men of wealth to demonstrate their commitment to po poetic activities as public works, and therefore involved a wide range of people in both the planning and conduct of the competition. For the most elaborate competitions, the sponsor will be expected to organise and furnish a venue appropriately, with seating, lighting and supplies for the writing and recording of poems and the tallying of wins and losses, as well as the personnel to do this. They were also expected to provide refreshments and catering, music and dance for entertainment between rounds or during interludes, and arrange for suitable rewards to be paid to participants. They might even be expected to provide the participants in the competition with suitable apparel for the event. Not surprisingly, this would require a significant economic outlay, and so being able to organise a poetry competition of this level was a statement of the sponsor's wealth and social status. As part of their organisation of the event, the sponsor had control over who took part in it and what their roles were to be. A person of status and importance will be asked to choose the topics for the competition. Daisha. The sponsor would choose the participating poets, kata udo, and also the leaders of the two teams, kata udo no kami. A further individual, senja, might be asked to make a selection from the poet's offerings to determine which will be included in the competition when it took place. A person with a good speaking voice will be chosen to act as a reciter, koji, and intone the poems allowed at the actual competition. And knowledgeable people, tokushi, will be designated to check the written poems for errors prior to passing them to the reciter. And a respected poet or poets will be asked to do the judging, hanja. Finally, there would also be a tally boy, kazushi warawa, who would keep score a score of wins and losses and draws. A suitable audience, Nenjin, would also be invited to the competition to provide a backdrop to the poetic activities and indicate appreciation for the poet's efforts. On the occasion of the competition itself, there would be an official revelation of the topics to the assembled company, Shidai, division of the poets into teams of the left and right, Katawaki, recitation of poems, Hiro, discussion and judgment of their faults and merits, gite, and formal closing activities such as prayers or a visit to a shrine or temple to offer thanks, or say. This level of complexity and elaboration, however, was reserved for the most formal and public utawase. Only 28 of the competitions held in the Heian period had separate individuals for all of these roles. An example of a contest of this nature would be the Engi Ju San Nen Sangatsu Tejin Utawase, the poetry contest held by former Emperor Uda in the third month, Engi 13, 913. Although even here, the intended judge failed to turn up, and Uda had to step in at the last minute and do the job himself. For others, a single individual might take on multiple tasks, the sponsor of the competition also choosing the topics and poems to be included, for example, or some activities would simply be omitted. Other variations in the activities were also possible. For example, the judge might not attend the competition, but having read the poems and the team's comments, render written comments and formal judgment after the event. Finally, a poet dissatisfied with the judge's assessment of his or her work could submit an appeal, chinjo, to the sponsor, arguing that they had been treated unfairly. The first of these appeals appears to have been written by the mother of Prince Yasusuke, Yasusuke or Nohaha, 
in response to the judgments on her poetry passed by Minamoto no Tsunenobu in Kaioi in Shichiban Utawase, the poetry contest in seven rounds held at the Kawa Kaya Town Palace in 1094, indicating that by this period women renowned for their poetic prowess and sufficiently confident of it to defend it were participating in Utawase in their own right. A poetry competition could also take place purely on paper or with only a single participant. In these Jika Awase, self poetry cop matches, which poets began to produce in the early 13th century, an individual poet would arrange their work in an utawase format and either provide their own judgments as a form of self-criticism or ask another poet to do so. The nature of the criticism provided in poetry competitions evolved as they changed from primarily social occasions to primarily literary ones. It became increasingly objective and analytical, by which it, I mean it impartially measured poems' quality against commonly understood critical criteria, and issued the commentary on the competition's location or the clothing of the participants, which was common in earlier utawase. It provided an opportunity for judges to advance their own ideas of what good poetry was, although frequently couched in the form of practical advice on how individual poems could be improved. Nevertheless, it rarely escaped from the wider social context. Judgments frequently depended upon the relationship between the judge and sponsor, or whether the judge's own poetry was included in the competition, meaning that absolute objectivity in a judge was neither expected nor required. There were also a range of social and conventional constraints on judgments, which limited what could be said. The first poem by the left could do no better than tie. The judge's own poetry could not win. Poems mentioning a deity must tie or win. Any poem by a reigning emperor must win, and so forth. This means that, with some exceptions, individual utawase judgments cannot necessarily be viewed as definitive statements of the judge's views on poetics. Instead, they need to be analysed and considered in the light of the judge's other writings, judgments and poetry to determine if they espouse a consistent view. Equally, it's important to remember that poems composed for utawase were themselves constrained by the conventions of the competition. This means that poems which were highly evaluated in other contexts could still be found wanting if they did not comply with the expe expectations of what utawase poems should be. And thus, just because a poem is criticised in a poetry competition, um, judgment does not mean that it is of intrinsically poor quality. Nevertheless, as utawase became more important as venues for poetic performance and evaluation, the standards by which their poems were judged became increasingly influential on all waka, and the judgments of the past were carefully scrutinised for instruction on how to write better poetry. In order to be a good utawase poem, a waka had to be composed on the defined topic, have a simple enough syntax that it could be understood when heard, and be formal, hare. This last criterion had two important elements. First, that the poem should avoid excessive personalism and the display of strong emotion. And second, that it should be realistic, in that the scenes it described should depict the world as it was known to be, at least in terms of the canon of prior poetry. It will be easier to understand how these abstract criteria worked if they're considered in the context of an actual poetry competition. So I'm going to illustrate them through the analysis of some of the poems, discussions, judgments and appeal in the Ropyakuban Utawase, poetry competition in 600 rounds. This competition is the second largest extant poetry competition, only exceeded by the Sengo Hyakuban Utawase poetry contest in 1500 rounds, organised by former Emperor Gotoba as part of his preparations for the compilation of the Shinko Kinshu. The latter contest, however, was judged by a committee of poets who each assessed a limited number of rounds, while Ropyakuban Utawase was judged in its entirety by Fujiwara no Shunze, who is considered the greatest of Japan's pre-modern critics. This meant that it was highly evaluated in later years, both because of its size and also as a result of it being the, one of the last competitions judged by a figure who commanded the respect of the majority of court poets, rather than being associated with one or other of the various poetic schools, which had divergent views on literary quality. As some four centuries later, for example, Hosokawa Yusai, the daimyo and scholar, stated, one should learn by observing skilled judges. Among poetry competitions, the 600 round one is superb for this. The 1500 round is eccentric. 
Minegishi Yoshiaki even goes so far as to suggest that Shunze's views in Rokyakuman Utawase were so influential that judgment essentially ceased to develop following that contest. Rokyakuman Utawase was sponsored by Fujiwara no Yoshitsune, who also chose the topics and participated in the competition himself. It was a highly structured event in that Yoshitsune had his 12 chosen participants produce hyakushu, 100 poem sequences, on each of his designated topics, 50 on the seasons and 50 on love, and then arrange these into the 600 rounds of the competition himself. This way, he could ensure that poems with suitable similarities and differences would be considered together and would elicit the best critical discussion between the participants and judgments from Shunze. The participants had a range of ranks and were of varying ages, but all had reputations as skilled poets. The contest has long been seen as a conflict between the Rokujo, conservative, and Mikohitari, modernizers, poetic factions, given that these were equally represented among the participants, as you can see here. Yoshitsune, Iefusa, Kanemune, and Jien were the four most senior aristocrats taking part and were not associated with either of the poetic factions, but Shunze was nominally head of the Mikohidari modernizers, although there's little evidence that he actually favoured them in his judgments in the competition. He did, however, consistently criticise the poems produced by Kensho, causing the latter to write a lengthy chinjo to Yoshitsune after the competition was concluded, which strongly resembles a poetics treatise in its own right. The inclusion of two such opposing views, Kensho himself states in his chinjo that they are like fire and water on poetics, only increases the critical importance of Rokyakuban Utawase. Broadly speaking, Shunze criticises Kensho's poems on the following grounds. Lack of appropriate formality for an utawase, principally failing to depict the real world in ways which have gained common acceptance as suitable in poetry. Incorrect use of diction, using individual pieces of poetic vocabulary with the wrong meaning. Lack of comprehensibility, alluding to obscure sources and using old-fashioned and uncouth expressions. Kenshaw's defence against these criticisms is, generally, that they are sufficient prior examples of poems depicting reality as he has done, that his own compositions cannot be faulted, that his interpretations of diction are correct and Shunze is wrong, so the latter's criticism is misplaced, that the charges of incomprehensibility are a measure of Shunze's own ignorance rather than faulty composition, and the use of old-fashioned expressions is more of a matter of opinion. He also suggests on more than one occasion that Shunze's criticisms are motivated by malice. The two poets' differing attitudes are, all, are, di are on display in Spring 218, where Kensho's poem is Haruhi ni wa sora ni no mikoso agaru mere, hibari no toko wa are ya shinu ran. The springtime sun alone into the skies does seem to lift the skylark, his nest. I wonder if tis in disarray. The right criticised the euphonics of this poem, stating that the initial line is grating, an opinion with which Shunze agrees, stating, In judgment, the initial stanza of the left's poem is truly awful. In general, from what we know of how skylarks live, there is no reason to expect that they would heedlessly fly off abandoning their nests. In spring, they raise their young in the fields, and when the evenings are warm or the spring sun is bright, they remain flying in the sky and look down upon their chicks from above. They are birds which swoop and soar. Thus, one cannot say that they heedlessly abandon their nests. Kenshaw interprets this as an attack on his use of multiple identical consonants in the phrase haruhi, and responds that the right's criticism may be because the poem was not to their taste, but that the springtime sun is an ancient term, and then cites a number of prior examples of usage, such as haruhi sasu fuji no uraba, Spring sun shines on the wisteria's under leaves. If kindly you do think of me, then I too will grant my trust. His defence is thus based on poetic precedent. If a phrase has been used in a chok senshu, the quality of whose works are beyond dispute, it is inappropriate to criticise him for also doing so. This, of course, conveniently ignores the evidence that at least some Chokusenshu attempted to balance excellent with less good poetry in order to make the good work stand out more and follow progression between poems. 
He is also suggesting that there is nothing erroneous about using expressions from the Manyan Shun in contemporary poetry. Shunze has a further criticism of Kenshaw's work, however, stating that it lacks sufficient formality as the scene it describes does not fit what is known of the normal behaviour of skylarks. One cannot say that they heedlessly abandon their nests. Kenshaw responds as follows. The judge has passed sentence on the facts and exerted great effort in finding fault, so I will correct him. It is normal practice in much Japanese poetry to prioritise the emotions and not to oblige matters to conform to reality. It seems in spring that Skylark simply saw, so composing that they would not abandon their nests will be just as much of a guess. If we are truly to examine the facts of the matter, him saying that Skylark saw in the skies looking down on the chicks in the fields could be felt to be questionable. It is impossible to know what a Skylark feels. If one is in a place where it can look down on its chicks in the undergrowth, it might be that it might not soar into the sky all that much. After this, he then goes on to cite 20 prior poems where the images used do not reflect realistic situations in support of his argument. Criticising Kenshaw's level of formality, however, is something Shunze refers to in Autumn 119, where he states of Kenshaw's poem, Takonoko, a hawklet on my arm have I not, yet the quails are crying on Awazu plain as day turns dark. I can only think that he has spent the entire day there pondering on hunting quail. This would indeed be an unrealistic action for a hunter to take. Kenshaw responds, however, that one might say that one was going hawking, but on getting there, despite having a hawklet to hand, the cries of quail so pierce the heart that one has no desire to leave a wazoo plain. He then adds that while, indeed, a hunter, hunter acting in the way Shunze describes would be the same as watching over a stump thinking to catch a rabbit, something which no one would do, but the nature of waka is to be true to the context of one's feelings and simply compose them as one wishes as orchids and chrysanthemums bloom. This is an example of where his defence of his work most resembles a work of poetics, but his defence takes no account of the fact that Shunze's criticism is constrained by the Utawase format and simply argues for the validity of his own poetry in isolation. Incidentally, his pithy phrase, watching over a stump thinking to catch a rabbit, is an example of him showing off his Chinese knowledge, as it derives from a famous Chinese phrase from the mid-3rd century BCE text Han Feiji, the writings of Han Fei. The original is guarding a stump waiting for a rabbit and occurs in an anecdote about a peasant who sees a rabbit killed by running into a tree stump and then keeps watch over the stump waiting for this to happen again, thus confusing a single chance event with a regular one. In any case, the two men's attitudes, however, are inconsistent and occasionally contradictory. For example, for his poem on the topic of love and painting, Kenshaw produces. Being despised and my unquiet heart filled with feelings, upon her I paint them out. This poem is based upon the story of a Chinese painter, Gu Kaiji, or Chang Kang, who, when he fell in love with a woman who refused to meet him, painted a picture of her and pierced its breast with a needle whereupon the woman fell ill with pains in her chest. And Gu Kaiji said he would be able to cure her, then removed the needle and replaced it with one dipped in honey. The woman recovered and was so grateful that she met with him. This Chinese story is so obscure that the right ask, what is the left poem about? And Kenjo has to explain. It reflects Chang Kang, who, feeling a woman living next door was beautiful, painted her and was then able to meet her. In his judgment, Shunze criticises this poem for a lack of transparency, saying, I too was unsure of the meaning of my unquiet heart filled with feelings upon her, and after reading the left's response, I am still unclear. In general, in these cases, it is customary to cite the source of such things, and to hear of such wide reading is interesting indeed, but this is simply, it reflects Chang Kang, who, feeling a woman living next door was beautiful, painted her and was then able to meet her so it will be difficult to locate within the usual three histories. Furthermore, I have no recollection of a person named in this Chinese manner, and so an ignorant old man like myself can only ask, 
Who is this Nagayasu? This is a somewhat facetious judgment in that Nagayasu would be the Japanese reading of the characters used to write Chankan. Kensho's response is somewhat intemperate and sarcastic. On the matter of the fault that this story of Chankang and the woman is non-standard, it certainly is. One should not compose based upon sources of which people are not normally aware is the substance of the aforementioned gentleman's ideas. During the discussion, I explained the basis for the poem in detail and even made it excessively clear. So it was, of course, entirely logical that there should be a lack of definite understanding of the question of who Nagayasu was. There is something which has been said since times of old. Writers often write shallowly, widely and mistakenly. The judge, too, is an unenlightened man, so there are things he does not know. Furthermore, while he finds fault based upon matters of which he is aware but is mistaken, there are many extremely famous examples of writers who have encountered sleeping dragons. Essentially, his argument is twofold. First, that an obscure Chinese source is appropriate as an inspiration for Waka because all someone would need to do is read it. He is thus stressing the onus of the audience in a poem to be sufficiently well read to understand a poet's allusions and sources. As a corollary to this, he is also asserting that Sinitic source material is appropriate for Waka rather than it needing to be based entirely on native material. On the other hand, there's his poem on Love and the Sea. Kujira toru sakashiki umi no sokomade mo kumi dani sumaba namiji shinogan. The whale hunting savage seas, depths, even there, should it be your dwelling, would I endure the waves? Here, Shunze criticizes his diction in the following in the poem for lacking a Chinese precedent, saying, when Emperor Qin Shui Huang sought Mount Peng Lai, although he said to shoot great fish, I have not heard that he went so far as to hunt them. Kenshaw replies that if particular expressions are lacking, in, are lacking in Chinese sources, then this is a matter of no importance for Waka. Elsewhere in the competition, though, Shunze remarks that some expressions sound remarkable in Chinese poetry, but sound wrong in Waka. There was clearly, therefore, an ambivalence on the part of both over the role of Chinese material in Waka and a concern to defend its integrity as the product of their own culture, illustrating the accuracy of Robert Huey's comment that there was more agreement on aesthetic issues than the various camps would like to admit. Finally, though, what sort of poems made the grade in Anutawase? Well, it was possible for a judge to award a tie of quality, Yokiji when he felt that the two poems of the round were both of excellent quality. Here's one from the poetry contest in 600 rounds. Furusato ni ideshi ni masaru namida kana arashi no makura yume ni wakarete. My home I left in floods of tears. The wild wind round my pillow breaks us apart in dreams. This is paired with Azumaji no yowa no magame o kataranam, miyako no yama ni kakaru tsuki kage. Upon the eastern roads all night I turn my gaze, tell him that, O oh moonlight, sinking toward the mountains round the capital. You'll see that I've been experimenting with what an AI art generator would come up with in response to these translations. I had to tweak the initial results a bit mainly adding Japan into the prompt to avoid getting something which lacked any connection with the country. And unfortunately, the Heian period is too obscure for it yet to provide any material. But I was pleased enough with these images to include them here. In any case, both the left and the right can find no faults with the opposing team's poem this round, and Shunze agrees. The left starts with My home I left in floods, and concludes with the wild wind round my pillow breaks us apart in dreams. This is a form of words, the quality of which I am entirely unable to convey with my own clumsy expressions. But the rites, O oh moonlight sinking toward the mountains round the capital, is awash with a sense of tears, so it is most unclear which should win or lose. Both truly seem to reflect the topic of love and travel well. The poems have been so good every round that my brush is drenched with this old man's tears, and I can find no other way to express it. I can think of no higher praise for a pair of poems than that. To conclude this brief discussion of Utawase, 
poetry competitions emerged from the society of the court nobility and ranged from social entertainments to political statements to literary events, often incorporating all three elements. They could incorporate extensive critical commentary and debate, or none at all, and they varied widely in terms of their locations, numbers of participants, status of participants, and degree of formal organisation. As they developed, they became increasingly constrained by con conventions on what poetry was appropriate for inclusion, how criticism should be expressed. Nevertheless, they remain an important resource for Waka studies, particularly for how poets viewed the essential nature of poetic topics and how these views evolved and how poets expressed practical criticism and debated and defended the critical points. To return to Hosokawa Yusei, there is nothing of such vital importance as poetry competitions. Through them, one gets the sense that one is hearing the voices of people from long ago directly. Indeed, we are. See you soon.